So what we're going to do is going to work through um, a series of uh, introductory concepts and themes and talk about how prostate biopsy has um, advanced. And then um, we, we, we have the, the absolute pleasure of having Matt Alloway here with us, who has really been somebody who's been incredibly progressive in understanding the perineal space and, and, and thinking about ways to do safer prostate biopsies, thinking about ways to do prostate biopsies that um, some of us believe maybe uh, have improvements in cancer detection. And so, uh, Matt, thank you very much for coming. And we're going to run uh, two slide decks. So in the middle of this presentation, we'll switch over. And then we hope to have time at the end of the presentation for questions, um, because again, it is an, an honor um, to have Matt with us. Um, and he can certainly address any tips and tricks that the folks may need. So, so really, I think uh, the way that I've progressed in my, uh, my thinking about prostate biopsy is um, really, and we're going to provide this as an overview because things have changed in this space as well, is really um, ways to optimize cancer detection while ensuring uh, patient safety. And so that really is somewhat foundational and, and begins with obvious things like biopsying the appropriate patient. Uh, secondarily, um, it involves techniques to optimize um, the detection of what, what we now consider to be important, which is clinically significant cancer, and also optimize biopsies to reduce patient morbidity. We're going to talk about these different things today. So this is a, a screenshot from the NCCN Prostate Cancer Early Detection guideline, which uh, Dr. Catalona is one of the, the thought leaders in. And this is their uh, stepwise um, stepwise recommended uh, algorithms for individuals who may present with an abnormal PSA. So uh, obvious things here, if someone presents to your clinic with an abnormal PSA, um, what you always want to do is repeat it. Um, you want to also rule out other causes of potentially elevated PSAs like infection. Uh, and then oftentimes internists don't do rectal exams, so do a rectal exam. And then I think where the space has really evolved and changed from this kind of concept of primary screening is really in, in what we do often in our clinics uh, here is really secondary or more advanced screening. And in the middle of the guidelines, that, that's uh, what they outline are two very helpful tools um, to kind of do tiered or augmented screening, and that's multi-parametric MRI and a consideration of use of biomarkers that improve the specificity of screening. Now, um, we uh, here at Northwestern have the pleasure of working with Bill Catalona, who has really been one of the thought leaders in prostate cancer screening uh, for um, much of his career and has made substantial contributions to it. And one of his more recent contributions was his collaboration with Beckman Coulter and others to really provide a tool for enhanced or augmented prostate cancer screening. And that tool is the Prostate Health Index, which we run here as part of our routine labs in the Northwestern Medicine System. And Prostate Health Index is a combination of uh, derivatives of uh, PSA, minus two pro PSA, free PSA, and total PSA. And it's a mathematical equation, which I show here on the bottom left portion of the screen. And Again, this is a tool that can be used to augment screening. And Ashley Ross and I wrote up while we were at Hopkins just our institutional experience, our early institutional experience with Prostate Health Index. And with, uh, with the help of Lori Sokol, who is a, a clinical pathologist, we actually took individuals who presented to our clinic who we evaluated for prostate biopsy. And then on banked uh, blood, we ran PHI. And these are individuals, this is around 200 individuals that all um, had went on to prostate biopsy. And on the right screen, you can actually see PHI. And then these numbers on the, um, on the Y axis are the different cut points that uh, Beckman reports that Dr. Catalona helped refine. These are re relative, these are quartiles of risk, quartiles of risk for being diagnosed with prostate cancer. That's how the test is reported. And those quartiles of risk, um, uh, then you can use as a tool. So this is just individuals who all, all underwent prostate biopsy on the um, x-axis. And so as you can see, 
Um, the black dots represent those individuals who are diagnosed with prostate cancer. And as you move to the right, these are more high-grade uh, disease uh, lesions, um, and the zero represents individuals who had no cancer. So you could have an elevated PHI and not have cancer. Um, you could have a low PHI, and you're unlikely to develop uh, cancer. And in our institutional, what we decided to do was create a, follow the cutoffs that Dr. Catalona helped develop. And so for individuals who had PHI tests below 27, um, you rarely missed a clinically significant prostate cancer. There were three individuals in our approximately 200 patient series um, that had that. And so we adopted a, uh, uh, a strategy where we used a PHI of 27 as a relative cut point for us to consider next steps in testing. And next steps in testing uh, for us, um, and again, this is just a reminder that the PHI test has been calibrated uh, to be between 2.5 and 10. And correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Catalona, um, I think that's where you typically use it. Um, you may go as low as two, but below that it's not, not uh, been as well validated. But with PSAs between 2.5 and 10, um, if the PHIs are less than 27, then we often, we, we did in this particular study and we do today recommend MRI. Bill, I see that you're off mute. Do I have this correct? So, yes, you have it correct. Yeah. And so um, if the PHI is over 27, that's above this red box, then we typically move to MRI. So what is the evidence that MRI can be helpful in the pre-biopsy, uh, biopsy naive space. Well, there's been a lot of work done in this particular space, and this is just um, one of the uh, large multi-institutional studies um, done, run out of the UK. This is the PROMISE trial, and these were individuals who underwent uh, MRIs. They uh, also had, um, uh, uh, they, they had one of two types of prostate biopsies, MRI targeted or standard biopsy in addition to having a saturation biopsy. And what the PROMISE trial showed is if you look at these bottom uh, rows here, that um, there, was an, there was an enhanced um, detection of clinically significant cancers in those individuals who had MRI targeted biopsies, and there was a reduction in the detection of low-grade Gleason gray group one cancers um, for individuals who had uh, MRI targeted biopsies. And so this was initial data that suggested that MRI could enhance the utility of transrectal prostate biopsies um, and enhance the utility of detection of higher grade lesions. Now, just last week, there was a follow up uh, article published in the New England Journal. It took a slightly different slant uh, than this particular study and there's a couple important things I want to point out. So this is a, a study out of Sweden um, and it was uh, a uh, based off of a, a population. This is a non-inferiority trial. They screened around uh, 12,750 men. If men had PSAs greater than three, uh, the median PSA in this particular group of middle-aged men was 4.3. They either were randomized to biopsy or a biparametric, not a multiparametric, Dave, but a biparametric MRI. And then if the MRI showed a suspicious lesion, they underwent a prostate biopsy. And the reason that it was a non-inferiority trial was because they wanted to say if you had a negative MRI, you would not undergo prostate biopsy. So they wanted to say, well, avoid avoiding prostate biopsies in some men was not inferior to doing um, biopsies in individuals and in all men. So you would not miss any high-grade cancers with the idea being you could potentially save some men from having prostate biopsies altogether, and you could also potentially decrease the detection of lower-grade prostate cancer. And that's what, in fact, they found. They found that this approach of a biparametric MRI, if the MRI was quote-unquote positive, proceeding to biopsy was not inferior to detect clinically significant cancer than biopsying everybody. And there was a lower rate of grade group one cancer. And that's just shown over here. These are the individuals in the study. So they screened 12,750 men. 
the uh, total um, number of patients um, evaluated was is listed here. It's around 2,400 men. And everybody in the experimental arm had an MRI, but only about 50% of individuals in the experimental arm had an MRI finding that warranted a, uh, or suggested that a biopsy was appropriate. So there is about a 52% a, a reduction in the number of biopsies performed. And with that 52% reduction in number of biopsies performed, the detection rate of Gleason 347 or higher or 437 or higher disease was equivalent in the two arms. So this implies that this is a non-inferior technique um, to, um, to biopsying everybody with a PSA over three. And there are follow-ups plans for these individuals in these studies. So they're not just assuming that this is successful and the individuals who did not have a prostate biopsy will be followed for multiple years to follow. And so I do think that uh, Tobias Nordstrom and uh, Mark Martin Eklund and uh, Henrik Romberg did design a very nice study. And hopefully we can discuss this in more detail later. Bottom line is they showed that MRI can be useful as a tool to risk stratify individuals who need a prostate biopsy. Um, you can avoid unnecessary biopsies. You can minimize detection of GG1 or grade group one prostate cancer and enhance the detection of higher grade disease. Now, um, all these studies rely on interpretation of either multiparametric or bi biparametric MRIs. So what, what pieces of information on the MRI are really important? Well, in addition to the RAD score, um, prostate volume is critical and um, as somebody who was a product of the teachings of Bell Carter and Pat Walsh, uh, we use prostate volume in our practice um, at Johns Hopkins all the time, and it is a very potent predictor of disease aggressiveness. So if you wanted to further refine um, the work out of these trials, you could consider incorporation of prostate volume and PSA density into your algorithm, and that's what Ashley and I and others in, in our original paper did at Hopkins. Now, we did that, but what, is there any data to suggest that you could integrate RAD scores on an MRI and PSA density and further refine the utility of a multiparametric or biparametric MRI? And the answer is yes. And so this is a nice paper that was published this year called PROMOD. This was a, a study that looked at five different cohorts of patients from four different countries. They defined optimal diagnostic strategies using the RAD score and PSA density. And this is a very, very complicated um, chart here. These are the different RAD scores. The darker colors are individuals who are diagnosed with cancer and the gray are those that had negative biopsies. And they developed decision curve analyses of multiple scenarios of RADs to PSA density of X or Y or Z. And they tried to come up with optimal scenarios. And I highly recommend uh, this particular paper, if you're a practicing urologist and you want to develop an optimal scenario for you to refine interpretation and utility of MRI uh, for that. I won't go over all the different scenarios they have. I'll show you the scenario that is closest to what I use in my particular practice, and that is individuals who have any RADS4 or RADS5 lesion, they get a biopsy. Uh, and in my particular practice, it's individuals who also have a RAD3 lesion. Now, the closest in this particular analysis were those who had RAD3 and a PSA density of more than 0.1. And or if you have a negative MRI and you have a PSA density of more than 0.2 in this particular decision curve analysis, this is the data for biopsy naive, naive individuals. So again, you can further refine the detection of higher, higher grade disease. Um, and there's a limited, um, a limited, um, limited opportunity to miss a gray group two or higher disease in these analyses. So I, I do recommend looking at this ProMod paper. It allows you to kind of pick of the 10 decision curve analyses, which criteria would best fit your practice to um, optimize the detection of clinically significant disease while minimizing the detection potentially of gray group one disease. And so what do we do? What, what do I do in my practice? If your PHI is above 27, I recommend a multiparametric MRI. Although Dave Casolino et al., maybe we should rethink that and consider biparametrics. They're faster and they're less um, toxicity to patients potentially. Um, and then individuals who have a RADS, RADS 3, 4, or 5, I biopsy. 
If you have a PSA density more than 0.15, I recommend a biopsy for you, even if your MRI is negative. And that's the approach I've used, and Ashley and I have published on that approach. So conclusion number one, um, as Dr. Catalona and the NCCN team have defined, use of advanced PSA-based markers, we use PHI. It's incredibly cost-effective um, and fast at Northwestern, and multi-parametric MRI can reduce the number of unnecessary prostate biopsies and enhance the sensitivity of detection of high-grade cancers. So um, why is it that multi-parametric MRI is needed to improve the quality of transrectal prostate biopsies? And this is, uh, again, the beginning of laying the groundwork for why potentially a uh, transperineal prostate biopsy may, in fact, be better. Um, and the answer is because when you do a transrectal prostate biopsy, um, you are sampling, you're trying to enrich the sampling of the peripheral zone, um, but the anatomy of the prostate does change as you move through the base, the mid, and the apex, and you may not necessarily optimize its detection. And here's just a couple examples of where prostate cancers could be hiding. And multi-parametric prostate MRI certainly improves the detection of prostate cancer with the transrectal approach. Now, this is a paper that Deb Sunday, who's now at Ohio State, and I published about 10 years ago, where we demonstrated that, um, that this, in, this phenomenon does exist. And, and actually, McNeil, um, uh, who was a, a pathologist at Stanford, first showed this phenomenon. But we showed in our cohort that individuals in a pre-MRI era who were of African ancestry had much higher rates of anterior tumors than uh, individuals who um, were Caucasian. And so this is just a summary of our paper. This data shows that there's a lot, a high prevalence of anterior tumors in African-American men, 50% in our series of around uh, 87 uh, 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 African-American men. Um, this was in a pre-MRI um, era at the time of surgical final pathology. So potentially the landscape of who we biopsy and how we biopsy them has changed. But this idea that there are anterior tumors uh, within the prostate that can be aggressive does exist. And this is a pretty recent publication that actually, again, confirms this. And this is, again, a evaluation of just under 1,200 patients. And what they showed in this nice paper uh, was that about only one-third of prostate cancers had posterior-only lesions. Um, about... Uh, depending on the MRI series, it looked at three to 9% of patients had anterior only lesions, and a majority of patients had lesions that straddled the anterior and posterior regions of the prostate. Anterior and posterior in their study and in our study was, was, was basically based on the relationship to the urethra. Now, this is important because transrectal prostate biopsies, um, depending on how you perform them, um, can miss or, or, and can potentially, or more, more, I guess a better way to describe it is could, it could potentially inaccurately sample this um, more anterior focused areas of the peripheral zone. And I know that Matt Alloway is going to talk about this when he talks. And so this is a, a good way to think about it. And it's important to think about um, where prostate cancers are in the prostate. It seems very rudimentary. Um, they're not just in the peripheral zone. The locations within, within the peripheral zone can vary. And so it's certainly reasonable to think that there may be alternate biopsy approaches that potentially en enhance the sampling of these tumors that straddle the anterior and posterior part of the prostate or exist only in the anterior portion of the prostate. So um, again, uh, MPMRI can certainly in, enhance the accuracy of detection of clinically significant prostate cancers with the transrectal approach. So those are uh, arguments to do A, tiered screening, and B, um, and B to um, use MRI to enhance the detection. What about um, uh, reducing patient morbidity? And so uh, transrectal approaches um, do have um, a possibility of infection, and with Almost all biopsies, we are putting a probe in the rectum and we are sampling uh, the prostate and there's pain associated with, with, with the procedure. So how can we optimize our, our approach to reduce this morbidity? And this is a paper that I wrote with Stacy Loeb when she was a resident at Hopkins. And it showed, this is a, an assay of a Medicare SEER. 
and it basically shows that over about a 16 year period of time, this is hospitalizations within 30 days of prostate biopsy and hospitalizations of individuals who are uh, over 65 years old within 30 days of a prostate biopsy, pretty high, about 5%. This was up through 2007. And um, this gray bar is just an average hospitalization rate for men over 65 in the overall Medicare SEER population. So if you had a biopsy, you had an above average rate of being hospitalized within 30 days. And we, in this paper, did um, explore possible options. And one of them was uh, rising infectious complications. Now, this is a nice paper from Marta Terrace, where she actually did prostate biopsies in individuals without any antibiotics. And then she looked at the urine and she looked at the blood. And overall, in her smaller series, about 16% of individuals immediately after prostate biopsy have bacteremia, um, and about 45% of patients um, have bacteria that you can grow out of the urine. So you definitely introduce bacteria into the prostate with a transrectal approach. And so um, the a AUA has developed uh, updated guidelines. They again say that hospitalization rates are around five to seven, or one to three uh, percent. Overall infections can occur in about five to seven percent of men. So. How can you um, reduce infections after prostate biopsy? They provide several approaches, and there is an approach that we use at Northwestern that was um, was really uh, developed by my father um, with several others, Teresa Zembauer and, and Robert Nather, uh, where we use uh, rectal swabs or targeted prophylaxis, and depending on the result of the rectal swabs, you you would then modify the peri-procedural prostate biopsy antibiotics. Now, um, this in this particular series, they reduced infectious complications um, to 0%. In real world at Northwestern, our complication, infectious complication rate is not 0%. Um, it's probably on the order of 1% to 2%, which is better than it was before, um, but there's still room for improvement. And so, um, and so again, um, how can we optimize or what are the other ways to think about performing prostate biopsies that are not transrectally based that can optimize in the detection of cancer and minimize patient morbidity? And is transperineal prostate biopsy the answer? And Matt Alloway is gonna talk about that uh, with us. Um, and this is an opportunity to not only highlight a lot of his pioneering work, but also an R01 grant I have with Michael Gorin, who's one of, um, who's one of Matt's partners, uh, Jim Hu, who's at Cornell and myself, uh, which is a, a, a prospective randomized uh, trial of transperineal versus transrectal prostate biopsy, evaluating um, complications and cancer detection. And so um, with that, I'm gonna transition over and, um, and load up uh, Matt Alloway's slides. Matt, are you, um, are you with us now? Ted, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, take the time with this um, this fantastic audience of um, outstanding urologists. And uh, thanks to Dr. Ross for also uh, weaving me into uh, some of your clinics where we've been able to do some didactic training. Um, I decided to do the tail end of this discussion so that I could um, go through uh, some videos and some anatomical details that I think are really important to understand when we transition to transperineal. Uh, my journey on this uh, started about eight years ago. I just decided that um, the future of transrectal was very was was a, a weak future because of certain limitations. I was concerned with uh, missing cancers. Of course, I was concerned with complications. I wanted to do a better job, and I knew that the, the answer was transperineal. I also knew that um, using a grid and a stepper approach was was not acceptable to me. I I I, I knew there, there was no future in mainstreaming this approach with a grid stepper with severe limitations that you'll see as we go through the presentation. Um, so I really went about trying to develop a methodology that could achieve the same cancer detection as a grid stepper saturation that could be integrated with MRI fusion, that could be done under local anesthesia, and could be done in a, in a time and resource utilization that was comparable to transrectal. And I, I, I initially did not have a device. Um, my first approach was 
a method that I um, presented at the AUA in 2014. It was the freehand transperineal approach using a coaxial needle. Um, I basically had a 14 gauge needle on the right and on the left. And then with one hand on the ultrasound probe, one hand on the biopsy gun, I would kind of find the tip of the needle and then try to navigate it toward the um, uh, toward the actual region of interest. And um, this method actually proved to be very effective. My cancer detection went from about 35% to upper uh, mid 50% range. Um, some of the critiques that I had when I presented this approach um, were that you know all the patients were sedated. Um, it was a complicated learning curve. It just wasn't, did not appear to be a mainstream approach. So I knew we had to, to standardize the approach. We needed to make it um, a better approach done under local anesthesia. And I worked um, for years on 3D printed parts and experimentation over and over again. And finally, um, this device, which you see on this slide is the device driven approach. Uh, next slide. So um, after being um, uh, CE marked and FDA cleared now for about four years, um, you'll see this slide with all the uh, clinical studies that have been done around the world using this device-driven uh, approach. Um, and the point of this slide is to show that um, the infectious complications have been reduced significantly. Um, most of the trials have showed not only uh, a zero infection rate, but a zero sepsis rate. Um, the um, trials um, were, none of these trials are sponsored by, by the company. These were all just uh, grassroots efforts to uh, change their method of biopsy. And you can see in, in these different trials, uh, almost half of the trials have been done without the use of any prophylactic antibiotic or any bowel prep. And that's the direction that, that I feel the future is. In fact, I've, I've stopped using antibiotics now about uh, three years ago, and we're about to publish our data showing equivalence and can, um, equivalence and um, a zero sepsis rate in, in an arm that has one dose of a cephalosporin and in the other arm, uh, no antibiotics. Um, next slide. Um, the, the biggest challenge we had uh, when we switched um, to transperineal was this idea that with a grid stepper, um, patients are placed under general anesthesia or a spinal anesthesia. This has to be done under local. And so um, uh, nearly all of our users have transitioned to local anesthesia. But one of the challenges I had was how do we do a block of the perineum? Uh, there was really no established block. Uh, we know there's a pudendal nerve block but in women, it's relatively easy because you can place a finger in the vagina, you could feel the, the ischial spine, and then you can um, you know, uh, use a, sp a special type needle to go ahead and, and, uh, and block the pudendal nerve. In men, it's, it's a bit more challenging, and, uh, but we, we did a lot of work trying to define the anatomy and figure out how we could possibly do this in a safe fashion. A lot of our initial work on the feasibility of the local anesthesia approach was done in the UK. The UK was uh, certainly um, much more progressive with this idea of switching the transperineal, and uh, a lot of work was done at Guy's Hospital. So as we taught them the method of doing it under local anesthesia, they first uh, started doing local anesthesia device-driven transperineal biopsies in the operating theater. They did it there in case they needed anesthesia to intervene with some form of sedation if it became too painful. So what you'll see on the first line is you'll see the first cohort that was um, that was uh, actually the first cohort was is the second line that shows the patients done in the day surgery center under local. And you could see the pain scores with probe insertion. The VAS score was six with local anesthesia administration it was five biopsy was 4.5. Overall, VAS pain scores was 4.5, which is higher than transrectal. But then they transitioned to the outpatient setting, just like it's done at Northwestern, and look at what the pain scores changed. The probe insertion dropped to 1, LA administration 3.7, biopsy pain score 2.8 um, for an overall pain score of 2.7, which is comparable to transrectal. You might say, well, what's the difference? They did the same block in two different settings. 
The difference is that in the clinic, the atmosphere is a lot less intimidating. There's only a couple individuals in the room. Um, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation with, with the doctor or the nurse practitioner and the patient. And uh, in the operating theater, you've got lights, you've got machine and, and beeping going on. There's a high level of anxiety. So what we learned is that um, to do it properly in the office setting, we need to um, create a nice atmosphere for the patient, dialogue with the patient, dim the lights, play a little music. I know um, people find this a bit corny, but it really does make the difference. And in the next slide, uh, Ted, um, uh, a group out of um, uh, Southern California under um, Richard Zabo's guidance, he uh, conducted his trial, um, all local anesthesia. And what you'll see here is that the, the first line shows the, the vast pain scores overall, and they were 3.9. And the second line, it includes the vast scores of men who had a prior <laughs> transrectal biopsy. So it was very similar, 3.9 to 4.1. But interestingly, based on historic memory recollection, their pain scores with transrectal was 4.6. Uh, the point of this is that, again, it's very feasible to be done under local anesthesia. And interestingly, many of our patients have had a prior transrectal biopsy, and they, uh, and oftentimes I find that the patients will report the pain as being less than transrectal or at least equivalent. Next slide. So how did we how did we develop the block? Well, most of our anatomy text um, they they give us a, a sketch similar to this slide, and what we need to appreciate is that um, the innervation for this approach. Uh, starts with the pudendal nerve. The pudendal nerve, as we know, exits the Alcox canal, which is on the inferior medial aspect of the ischial tuberosity. Um, the first branch that comes off the pudendal nerve, it runs over to the um, external um, sphincter apparatus of the anus. And then there's another branch that quickly uh, branches off toward the, um, the urethra and the penis. But the main branch that we're concerned with, with transperineal biopsies, is all the branches that then fan through the perineum. And you see this, this asterisk black mark. That's the sweet spot that we need to direct the block. Now, with our approach, the point is that the patient will never have more than two punctures in the perineum. So the asterisk mark represents the access points. And those are the nerves in yellow that we're attempting to anesthetize. Now, we're, we're about two and a half to three centimeters from Alcox Canal. So if, if done properly, we often and typically include that branch that comes off and dives toward the anus and the external um, anal sphincter apparatus. Next slide. Um, the, um, the main uh, bundle of nerves um, live within um, and surrounding the pelvic floor muscle, the levator muscle, which is easily seen on ultrasound. So um, as we inject the lidocaine, we're injecting from the skin to the pelvic floor muscle, and we're injecting small boluses to create a tunnel. And then once the needle approaches the, the pelvic floor muscle, we give one bolus there, and then the needle is inserted within the muscle, and a larger bolus is delivered at that point. The final bolus is some nerve branches that sit underneath the muscle, um, which would be between the um, apex of the prostate and the, and the endopelvic fascia lining the interior surface of the pelvic floor muscle. I call this a space of alloway. Why? Because there was no other name. I have no ego about this. I just needed to come up with something to describe this space. So if we move to the next slide, uh, I've actually tilted this image uh, to mimic the dorsal lithotomy position. Where you see the black arrow is where the access trocar will sit. It sits right in front of the pelvic floor muscle. And, and you'll see why all these components um, come together. So if we go to the next slide, Ted, and hit play, um, and then there should be over to the bottom right there, Ted, can you take the volume button down to zero? Okay, good, it is. Okay, so here we're inserting the um, the uh, transrectal uh, probe in, and we're scanning the prostate in the axial and sagittal image. The image um, you're seeing now is the perineum exposed, and I'm placing two my uh, skin marker on the access point, which is approximately the width of the bumper at the end of the stabilization bars. I then have the patient cough, 
And right at the moment the patient coughs, I use a 25 gauge needle to inject a skin wheel. At this point, you only want to use a CC or two. Uh, the 25 gauge needle is one and a half inches long, so you can actually inject it deep in, into the subcutaneous tissue. So we inject the right side and then we rotate over to our left side at access point. Again, have the patient cough. If you have the patient cough right at the moment that you stick the needle in the skin, it distracts the circuit in the brain. 85% of the time, the patient doesn't even feel the stick. And then you inject a little bit deep at that point, if you wish. And then um, we take the carriage with the access trocar and we slide it onto the device along the sliding rails. Um, and here I've positioned the access trocar, which is a 15 gauge needle at the second from the bottom aperture. I haven't punctured the skin now. I'm actually advancing the trocar and depressing into the skin wheel, but not puncturing the skin. Now it's important to watch. I've got a, a, a six inch 20 gauge spinal needle. And as you can see in the bottom there where Ted is highlighting, I'm advancing the needle straight to the pelvic floor. I gave a bolus right on top of the muscle, in the muscle and right below the muscle. Then I pull the spinal needle out, rotate to the left side, pop through the skin wheel, advance the needle straight on and bolus right there in the, um, in the muscle. Um, so we'll kind of play through this one more time just so you can um, uh, on slightly closer inspection. So the point, can you pause this for one second, um, Ted? Now, how lateral are we from the midline for this whole <laughs> block? You want to be pretty much on the very lateral edge of the prostate. So you can see a very small image of the prostate in the sagittal, and then you can see the seminal vesicles also. This bolus does not direct medial toward the midline because the goal here is to block all of the distal branches <laughs> of the pudendal nerve. In fact, even if you rotate slightly out of the prostate, you might even achieve a better block. The problem is when you rotate out of the prostate, the landmarks become a little bit more fuzzy and it's uh, often a little more difficult to know that you've hit the sweet spot. But if you keep that image um, embedded in your mind, <laughs> you'll always get to that sweet spot. So and we'll Matt, continue to play through this. Yeah, and then yes. Matt, just for the audience's dark band is the pel are the pelvic floor muscles. So you'll see the needle come in and then he'll anesthetize the fascia on the muscle and then in the muscle, right, Matt? Exactly. And you also see the inferior pubic arch um, there right under my spinal needle. And here, and when you're when you're injecting the bolus in the pelvic floor muscle, you watch the hypoechoic lidocaine streak go all the way to the anterior capsule and all the way down to the rectum. And here I've switched over to the left side. I just advance the needle and here's the bolus, watch the lidocaine track. And then I put a little bit in front and then I come right out with the needle. The bolus that's in the, the space of alloy, if you will, the submuscular space right over there, it's basically a little bit of a hydrodissection. And that, that here is a perfect appearance of, of a genuine block. Um, and that's the block. Um, you know, the block takes just a couple moments. And then once you're done with the block, you, you don't go immediately to the biopsy. Give the patient a good minute, a minute and a half. This is a good opportunity if you're using fusion, you can go ahead and, and complete your, your, um, your contouring and registration of lesion. If you're not doing a fusion, you could do your measurements of the prostate or just scan the prostate, take a look around and plan your biopsy. So the next slide gets to the real, um, really exciting um, business of transperineal. So here you have a biopsy template. Now this template was designed after doing about 2000 biopsies. And when we first started doing transperineal, we didn't know where we need to stick the needle. So our initial work was sort of doing the biopsies in rows and columns, kind of mimicking a grid stepper. But we realized after analyzing data that there were areas of the prostate that just did not harbor cancer. Cancer could grow into these areas, but they didn't originate. And this is something that takes a little bit of time to wrap your head around, because when you when many people think of transperineal biopsies, they think that you know, we're, we're biopsying a box. And if the box is 40 millimeters long and our biopsy gun only fires 10 millimeters, then you or uh, 16 to 20 millimeters, then you'll have to do an apical bite and a basal bite. Well, the reality is that's not necessary from what we've learned. 
So everything in purple and green, I call a no-fly zone. Everything in blue and orange is where we want to sample. And when we talk about anterior tumors, many experts feel that it's anterior transitional zone tumors. And that's partially correct. Our belief is that the transitional zone does not harbor um, significant disease. Um, it occurs anterior to the transitional zone and it grows and invades the anterior prostate. I've never seen one case of a significant prostate cancer in the posterior half of the transitional zone that was isolated that hadn't grown into the posterior transitional zone. So why would cancers originate from the anterior transitional zone? Well, the answer is we don't believe it does, but we do need to biopsy the anterior prostate. And that's, a, that's the real benefit of transperineal biopsy. The only area we need to biopsy with a deeper bite toward the base is in the corner pocket, which is right by the seminal vesicle in blue. So we'll move to the next slide and show you some MRI evidence of this, this sort of um, relationship. So this is a sagittal image in the T2, and what you see, yellow is the urethra, blue is encircling the peripheral zone, and just um, proximal to that strip of uh, peripheral zone is a dark area. That's the green, which is the central zone, and then the seminal vesicles are behind it. I don't care how big the prostate gets, this peripheral zone medial under the, under the prostate, uh, you know, urethra region, it never elongates as the prostate grows. It gets compressed posterior and apically, but it does not elongate. Next slide. However, if you, if you roll out, uh, or this is an ultrasound image showing the same relationship. So here, the central zone is calcified, and you can clearly see the delineation between the peripheral zone and the central zone. So if you measured the length of this prostate, it'd be 38 millimeters. You know you can't biopsy that whole strip with one bite of the gun, but you can if you appreciate where the peripheral zone lives. Next slide. Uh, this slide I, I would love to hang in my office because it's beautiful. It shows that as you move posterior lateral, this is a coronal slice of the prostate. If I went another slice down or two, you'd be in the rectum. So where Ted is highlighting is where the peripheral zone elongates posterior lateral in blue on the template. You can see on the MRI image, you can actually see the central zone there dark, and you can actually see the line of delineation between the transitional zone and the central zone. So that's why we do not need to biopsy the areas in uh, purple or green. Now, if the MRI says there's something there, if you want to biopsy that region, by all means, biopsy it. But their goal was, how do we minimize the number of cores from a transrectal template uh, saturation to this new world of transperineal? So we'll move to the next slide and talk a little bit here about the anterior zone. So outlined in blue is actually um, a PIRAD4 lesion, but it also shows the area that these anterior cancers actually originate. You can see that the cancer originated above the transitional zone and is growing into the TZ. But that's where the needle needs to, uh, that's where the needle flash needs to be is in that area, just a couple millimeters under the anterior capsule. You can also see from the MRI that the peripheral zone, um, you know, can vary. Like here, the patient has anterior horns that come about halfway up, but you need to look at the the anterior horns. By the way, why do they call them anterior horns? We don't have posterior horns. Maybe we should just call them horns. Um, but some, the bigger the prostate is, the smaller the anterior horns. They become compressed and push posterior. So as you go from a prostate that's, let's say, 20 grams to 50 grams, the number of cores to properly sample goes up. But after you get above 70 grams as the prostate enlarges, the number of cores actually begins to drop slightly because many of this territory on our template has been squeezed out by the enlargement of the transitional zone. Next slide. Um, and here is just another um, slide just kind of showing the interplay between these zones. So one thing that we need to appreciate on this slide is that with a grid stepper, you're either gonna be lateral biopsying the transitional or you're gonna be medial. Our goal is to get apex all the way along the strip. And that's why you'll see in the, in the video showing the procedure, our hand motions are either pointing to the midline of the patient, the collarbone, or the patient's ipsilateral shoulder. So we stay in that seam of relevant tissue. And thus we have the template. Now we argue 
incessantly with all of our academic partners on how many cores do we take? My attitude personally is that why does it matter? If, if more cores taken does not equal more pain, more infection, or any other morbidities, but improves cancer detection, then I'm going to do it. And there's a lot of debate and a lot of studies ongoing trying to find the sweet spot. I personally tend to take about 20. Um, maybe the sweet spot's 18. I, 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 this uh, discussion is not about how many cores to take. This is about if you, if you do not have an MRI and you follow this template, you should achieve a cancer detection rate of around 70% with more than 50% being clinically significant. Okay, the next series of slides is showing you what each biopsy sector should look like on sagittal and axial image. Uh, the cursor is on sagittal, this is anterior medial, and on the transverse um, ultrasound image, you see the flash. Actually, my yellow arrow is off, but it's actually right at the 12 o'clock position um, as a flash. Okay, next slide. This uh, is just, Matt, this is yeah, what th you're showing right here, This these orange areas, anterior medial. Oh, exactly. Um, yes, I, I minimized that image, it's hard to see. On the next slide, um, it's anterior lateral, and you can see now that I'm above the transitional zone on the sagittal, and I'm about two millimeters underneath the capsule. And then on the image to the left, which is the axial image, you see the flash at the very tip of the anterior horn. Now, um, and that would correspond on our template as being the orange anterior lateral region. Okay, the next slide demonstrates the image view of the posterior medial. Now, I love this biopsy. I, I love it because when I find cancer right under the urethra, I can tell you it's it seems more, more likely to be clinically significant and quite nasty often, um, and I'm not sure why. But this area, I never biopsied with transrectal because I would wind up in the urethra and there would get a lot of hematuria. But with this technique, you should always be 100% in the peripheral zone, beautiful sample, never hurt the urethra, and you'll get a good representation of this region. Okay, and finally, um, actually, no, two more. So this is posterior lateral kind of uh, riding up the anterior horn. So the image to the right shows all um, ultrasound uh, peripheral zone. You wanna make sure you don't, see, you don't dive into the transitional zone. And then the image to the left confirms the flash being lateral to the transitional zone, but riding up the anterior horn. We know from trans the extended, when we went from six cores to 12 cores, this is the region that we were sampling better with transrectal. And here we're getting a full sampling of, um, of the peripheral zone in this region. And finally, the base biopsy. Um, and this is the area, okay, I love the image to the right because here's a big prostate, 150 grams. You can see how thin the peripheral zone is but you can also appreciate how we can fly right in that little seam of tissue and still sample just peripheral zone. But what I've done here is I've advanced my needle tip um, on the left image, sagittal, I've advanced it about halfway into the prostate and then I fired the gun so the tip of the biopsy gun lands inside the seminal vesicle. And I do that if the prostate length necessitates it. If the prostate's very short, you may not need to get that core because you'll get it with your posterior lateral biopsy. Okay, so now that we've showed you all this anatomy, I'm just gonna show you, um, there, of all the data that's been produced from all the centers, we're seeing consistent um, cancer detection rates following the template method of about 70%. If MRI is being utilized, those numbers go up a bit higher, 75%, even up into the 83% range that we're seeing in the UK. But this is a very nice study that was published recently by Mike Gorin when, when he was doing this work at Hopkins. And he worked, he took over Bal Carter's active surveillance cohort. And um, uh, the cohort to the right had a transrectal, their confirmatory biopsy, transrectal Euronav guided. And the cohort to the left was transperineal device driven cognitive uh, targeting. And the results were actually uh, rather impressive. If you look at the upgrading on this confirmatory biopsy with transperineal, 24% um, of the patients with PIRAD3 lesions were upgraded and only 14% in the transrectal group. And then even more impressive, um, those with PIRAD4 lesions were upgraded 45% of the time with transperineal and only 28% of the time with transrectal. 
So now we're seeing more and more centers publishing data showing that not only is transperineal showing um, superior cancer detection, but it's also showing superior results in the fusion, MRI fusion space. The next slide is a video, and I think this is the, the most fun of the talk. And this is a, a video without fusion. And here, um, I've already done the block. And now here you can see my access trocar sitting in the, in the perineal scruff, just in front of the um, uh, pelvic floor muscle. And then here I've got my probe pointing. Um, actually, I'm doing, this is what I'm doing right here. I've got my spinal needle again. I'm doing what's called the tap test. So before each quadrant is biopsied, here I'm gonna biopsy the right posterior uh, quadrant, I do a tap test. So basically I tap the pelvic floor, mimicking the biopsy with my spinal needle. And I, I don't tell the patient anything, I watch their eyes. And if they feel anything, it shows, the eyes never lie. If, if, they, if they make a little motion of feeling something, I add a little more local. In this case, he felt nothing. So now I'll grab my biopsy gun and here I've lined my probe right up the midline, pointing right up the patient's nose. And my goal here is to fly through the access trocar directly into the capsule. I pierce the capsule, pierce. So, so, Matt, so Matt, just so the top, tell them about the, the split screen. So the bottom okay. is the sagittal and the top is yes. the same. Exactly. Um, know your probe. And, you know, the, the axial transducer is actually distally positioned on the probe. So... That's why you're seeing the bladder right now and you're seeing the full prostate on sagittal. But this patient, I like this video because he, his, his posterior, his pseudo capsule, the transitional zone has been calcified. So here you can easily see the delineation between peripheral zone. And, and Ted, can you point out, you can see where the peripheral zone stops. See the line um, actually go down a little bit between the central zone and the peripheral zone. There's actually a dark line that distinguishes between the, and you can see this so beautifully with these nice transperineal probes. So here, um, okay, tap test completed. Now I grab my BARD. Um, it's a 20 centimeter gun, not the 25. You want a shorter gun, it's more steerable. And it's um, 18 gauge, same as you're using for transrectal in that regard. So here, um, here there's the access trocar sitting in the perineal scruff. And I take my biopsy gun and I just watch it fly in. So it's like a runway and each biopsy site is a new runway. So here I pierce the capsule, walk the needle back. Then I lift my probe with my left hand to flatten out the runway. So I stay right in the peripheral zone, biopsy. And after you fire the gun, pull the probe out and look for the flash on the axial. And there it is right under the urethra. That's your first core. Then you march five to six millimeters lateral by translating the probe slightly lateral and pointing a little more toward the collarbone. And again, you just fly into a, a, a new independent runway, um, fly in, pierce the capsule, walk it back, lift the handle of the probe slightly, fire, and look for the flash. And there it is, about five millimeters lateral. And we keep marching right at that level, going from midline all the way to the posterior lateral. Here I pierce, anchor, fire, and you can see how the biopsy needle runs the entire distance of the peripheral zone. See, with transrectal, you're basically traversing the peripheral zone and probably entering the transitional zone with every core. Here now, I'm pointing my probe to the patient's ipsilateral shoulder, and I fire. And there it is, right at the, that is the most important core. The highest cancer yield is in that core you just saw. Now I'm going to ride up the anterior horn through the same puncture in the perineal scruff, and here I biopsied five millimeters anterior to that very posterior lateral core. Now I'll move to the base, and now I look for, you know, actually I took one more on the anterior horn, um, another three millimeters anterior to that. So I, I basically climb up the anterior horn until it ends. I slide my core on the sponge, and then now I'm gonna go for the base, so I look for the seminal vesicle as I'm pointing to the shoulder, go halfway in, and then pop right into the um, seminal vesicle. And I, I usually take two cores there. I think you can get away with one. I come a little bit medial, posterior medial to the first base core, and there we go. There's no need to go any more medial at the base because you'll enter uh, central zone, and that's not important. Here I put a thumb on the back of the device, and I pull the carriage off the rails, and I move my access trocar to a higher position. I'm gonna go second from the top, and you'll learn on your own which is the sweet spot for um, 
through your own hands. And now I go back through the same puncture, back into the same position in the perineal scruff. But look at it. Now I'm anterior displaced. And this is the beauty of transperineal. This is what, it, so in the UK, they call the transrectal biopsy a crap biopsy, cannot reach anterior prostate. With transperineal, look how we can so nicely fly. Oh, I did, okay, here's the tap test. So right anterior quadrant tap test, negative tap test. There's my access trocar on the lower ultrasound screen. Now, I, now I'm flying right above the urethra. And my position is to pull the probe slightly out and drop the handle. And here I'm flying right next to the urethra. And now I'm getting that beautiful seam of anterior tissue. It's as easy as one, two, three. It's fun. And you'd be surprised at how much cancer. So I'm finding about 35%, 38% of patients have disease anterior. And about 17%, it's only anterior. Here I just, now same position, but pointing a little bit to the collarbone. I come five millimeters lateral. Now I'm in the anterior lateral sector anchor. And look how the length of the prostate is short. So you, there's no need for a deeper or a basal sample. And now I finish the anterior lateral sector by coming about three to five millimeters anterior to the posterior lateral core I took. And I'm pointing to the patient's shoulder and there's the flash on the axial. And that's a complete right-sided sampling. I, I didn't uh, include the left side. I figured uh, my time is exhausted, but here I just roll over to the left side, anchor into my left-sided access point. And final slide, and this is more important than anything, training is key. This is a picture I took in Italy. Um, I've been dedicated to traveling around the world. I've trained about 200 urologists, and they've trained many more themselves. Um, it has to be done right. It has to be trained. It looks easy. It will become easy. But we, you know, we've got to get out there and train the urologists, the ones that are in residency. They have access to great leaders like um, Ted and Ash, and they're taken care of. But um, my job is trying to train as many urologists and, and the movement is gaining steam and it's been, it's been a lot of fun. And I thank you for your time and open up to any questions. Thank you, Matt. That was great. And just as a, a, a plug, uh, Matt and I and Ashley were in town uh, in the hospital this weekend, last weekend doing a training course for the residents. And we hope to um, extend that to other residents and to um, and to uh, interested um, urologists throughout the uh, Midwestern area. Questions for Matt? So how many, Matt, how many transperineal prostate biopsies are performed annually, do you think, uh, in America these days? Well, um, how many biopsies are done total? Um, you'd be surprised. Actually, real data showing it's about 1.8 to 1.9 million biopsies. Um, now, that number went down during COVID. That number went down after the, the task force made um, terrible recommendations. But, but those are real numbers. Now, how much are transperineal? Well, I can tell you that this year, um, over 40,000 men will be biopsied using this method you just saw. Um, that doesn't include, and I don't know the number, still doing grid steppers, um, but we estimate that less than 5% of biopsies in the U.S. are done transperineal. Um, we fully expect that um, transperineal will be the future, that we'll look back at transrectal and say, well, I guess it worked at the time, but clearly, once you start doing these biopsies, and I should ask you this question, um, I was so nervous to present my work to the Schaefers because, you know, um, Ted's dad developed the rectal swab, and here this guy, this guy comes along from nowhere saying, well, maybe this is better. Um, but you could tell us your experience, but I mean, once you start doing it, you start to think about it, and you're like, wow, why would I do it any differently? I, I just... Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, I... Um... You, you know, you told me that it. you thought it took five cases, and I think it took five cases for me with you there to learn the, the approach. But as you know, I invited you back after doing them for six months to really refine my technique. And I do think that, that whenever you're learning something, it's always good to have the master come back and learn from them. Um, I think the Schaefer approach is to minimize uh, morbidity uh, when doing the procedure. So the rectal swab was highly effective at reducing the morbidity with, um, without 
substantially augmenting the antimicrobial, you know, prophylaxis spectrum for the patient. And um, as you mentioned, we've been doing them here for 18 months now, um, no antibiotics, um, and we have not had any infections. So um, I think it's a highly effective technique. I do think that you have to practice it, but that's true for everything that you do in your clinical practice, but I'm very pleased with it. And we are um, in the midst of recruiting individuals for our prospective trial, transrectal versus transperineal prostate biopsy, looking at cancer detection and complication rates. Um, and so um, I think um, it's nice that we can do this in the setting of a, a prospective trial so we can definitively um, find the answers. And the trials we have open right now are for both individuals who have initial four-cause biopsy and those individuals who are presenting in surveillance or for repeat prostate biopsy. So if you have patients that may be interested in participating in our trial, I'll definitely encourage you to do that. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see the results of the trial. I think it will, again, affirm what Matt has shown in his his uh, in his own personal series, which is uh, very nice uh, data. So, um, but uh, you know, Matt is willing to fly out, but now Matt is asking me to, if I can, step up and, and help folks in the Midwest do it. And certainly, we're honored to do that as well. So, other questions from the audience? Okay. Well, we've gone a little bit over time. So Matt, um, it is 734 in, in Maryland, and I want to let you get back to your family. Um, please say hi to Kelly for me. And uh, for the audience, thank you for uh, participating in this great session.